Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Gottfried Tonumras, as I've been introduced. Uh, I run the Logos Foundation. The Logos Foundation is something that I started some 45 years ago, so way back in the late 60s, and we are now housed in the building that you see on that little slide. In 68, 69, I took a decision never to repeat old music, never to make anything else than do new music. It was kind of logical in the atmosphere of that time, and as a conservatory student in music, it was at that time such that in the conservatories you just played Bach, Beethoven, etc. But you did not, we are not supposed to make your own music. Whereas in the Academy of Fine Arts, all the painters there, they could make their own paintings. They would never paint Van Eyck again or Rembrandt again, etc. So we took the model of, of the Fine Arts Academies and wanted to introduce that in music life and music education. But with the decision of playing new music, only new music, had a consequence. Because isn't it kind of strange, if you want to devote your life to new music, that you would do that using only tools of the very past? Isn't it, in principle, a mistake to suppose that if we want to express ourselves musically nowadays, that we should still do that with the tools from the 17th and 18th century, that we still play violins and pianos and clarinets and trumpets? All the instruments that are taught at the conservatories are at least 100 years old. Who says that if you want, want nowadays tools for musical expression, that you can still use these old tools, that they are adapted to the kinds of uh, sonic structures that we want to develop nowadays as tools for musical expression? That's one thing. So in a ver very early stage with Logos, I was fascinated by making new sonic worlds and by making instruments uh, for that. Obviously, if you take those years, the way to go was electronics. So I started designing synthesizers of different kinds, the first actually digital machines also, but all purely electronics based. I've done that for about 15 years, and at some point in my life, I, started, I stopped that completely and said, no, this is completely wrong, and I will tell you why. Because if you are, as a musician, on stage with electronics, be it analog equipment or laptop computer, it's even worse actually. The only thing you get to do as a musician is turn a knob here and there, maybe switch a wire, touch a touchpad, etc. Nothing of your motoric behavior on stage is intrinsically related to what you do musically. Moreover, all the sounds that you make are by necessity the outcome of loudspeakers. Now, what is a loudspeaker? A loudspeaker is just a piece of paper, a cone in paper that moves over and back and does as if it is anything else but the real source. So if you look at the loudspeaker, nothing is revealed of the sound source, properly speaking. So it handy loudspeakers and electronic music fundamentally handicap musicians that have a desire to be on stage. They undermine the rhetoric of music that is so basic for, get it, for conveying your musical and expressive uh, message. So after some escapades into different instruments where I took up acoustical means again, I decided to go for robots. That's the reason why I'm here. And robots, why? Well, first of all, a robot, a mechanical robot as a musical instrument, is a musical instrument, it can be a traditional one or it can be a completely newly invented one, that you automate. Now it has always been strange that in music so little things go automated. If we see our daily lives around us, we see in the industry, welding for instance is done by robots much better than by people because they are much more precise. If you come here, I think most of you came here by car. Why did you come here by car? Because it can be pretty tedious to walk here if you come from another city, etc., or even a bicycle is also a tool, by the way. 
but you use tools to extend the human possibilities in all respects of daily life. It is what we're doing. Why would we not do that in music? Why are there still people so crazy as to practice eight hours a day in studying a piano and pushing the keys on the right moment with the right expression, whereas you can easily make a machine to do that for you? Not only that, not only can what we do, at, at least we try to do that, can, be, can we automate these things, but the perspective, and that was my main motivation for going into robots, is that we can also extend way beyond what is musically possible. But there is one thing I can certainly state is that people do not get, they get any better in their motoric. We don't get any faster, seriously, even, even not if we practice a lot. Whereas machines get always better, as long as we design better and better machines. Now there are other limitations connected to our bodies. If I play the piano, I have 10 fingers. Okay, I have 88 keys, but only 10 fingers, so this limits my musical thought to music composed in only a few notes, as many as I have fingers that I can use. But it's not only the sheer number that can be overdriven by automating them. My piano, for instance, my automated piano has 88 fingers, so it solves the problem of polyphony altogether. The other problem is that no human will ever be capable of, for instance, taking the little finger at pianissimo, this one forte, this mezzo forte, and do dynamical nuances between the different fingers. My machine can do that. All my machines are designed such that they have way more expressive possibilities than humans. They do not surpass human possibilities in every aspect, but in many respects they do. Also in another aspect that's maybe less obvious for the non-musical specialists, etc. but most of our instruments are made and designed to play in the 12 tone scale, so they have 12 notes an octave. Most of my robots can either be programmed to play just about any imaginable scale, or if it is a limited scale, like in the organ robots, I have a few, uh, can be quarter tone, so 24 notes an octave, which extends the possibilities way beyond what's possible. Other composers have done experiments with quarter tone music long before me, but they were always crippled by the lack of musicians. Musicians are never uh, very hard to convince to study a new instrument if there is no music to play on it. And if you make new music for new instruments, you find no musicians, so it's a uh, chicken and egg problem. That's why in the beginning of the 20th century, none of these adventurous composers with novel ideas really, really got taken off ground with their projects. We are now, well, the beginning of the 21st century. So far in the last 20 years, I've built some, well, 54 robots today, yes. I brought one here, and you will see a few more on the slides. Uh, this is a pretty recent one. I will give a brief demonstration and let it play something so that you are convinced that they play automatic. Just push one button. Just a brief demo, and guaranteed no clarinetist will ever be able to play this, this piece <laughs> because it's too fast, it goes way beyond the range, etc. To delve into something else, making robots doesn't solve the problem, and so far I did not sh show you actually a robot, I showed you a musical automaton, an automated instrument, nothing, nothing but that. But they are really robots because the context in which I make them but it gives them, they have all sorts of interfaces so they can play together with people. 
because there is no big point in having a robot orchestra that only plays files and pre-existed compositions. The real challenge is to play them, really to interact with them, and to free the people from the mastership of musical instruments and give them instead a freedom of expression that they can remap on instruments. Now, that takes me into the second very important part of my research in the last years, that is gesture sensing. Since I realized that all musical instruments are actually played by movements of our body, be it our cheek, or be it uh, with hands, be it like this, or be by drumming or by fingering, but it's always to do with our motoric. So if we could get information from our gesture and translate that one way or another into information that we can apply to commands for the robots, we would have a universal instrument. The instrument would, would be the medieval craftsmanship, the, you could do all the, all the technicalities, and I could concentrate on making the music and to convey the expressive things I want to do. So the technology I used for that, for gesture sensing, is based on either microwave radar sensing or uh, sonar systems. They work with transducers. We have a small setup in the back that you can see in the intermission because we brought some and some more robots, by the way. It works with one emitter that sends out waves, so acoustic or microwave, and it reflects from the body. And I have X, Y, and Z uh, receivers. Then I have a computer program that does estimations of what the body in movement is doing. Now, how it works is that it works on the principle of Doppler reflection. So when you stand still, the received signals by the sensors are the same as the emitted signal. It's identical. However, as soon as you move, the original wave is Doppler shifted a bit depending on how fast you move. The amplitude of the movement of the Doppler shift is a function on how much uh, body mass you move, body surface, in fact. So the computer tries to map all these things and to see the gesture as such. So it's not a visual perception system. There is a next stage where it comes really to gesture sen sensing, where you can now devise a sort of grammar of gesture. For instance, gestures are expressive in that if I do this, that's a collision, because I, I go against something. If I do this, it's smooth. If I do edgy, I make certain changes, etc. It's not a characteristic. So my software for the uh, gesture control actually uses these aspects of human gesture to control the robots in different contexts. And that's uh, the project. You see some on the pictures, probably. An essential as aspect that caused me some trouble, uh, well, trouble, or at least some discussion and rumors at times, is that all the performances using this technology have to be naked, completely naked, for it works on reflection from the skin. And as soon as you wear Clots, etc. These reflection coefficients drop by at least 12 to 18 dB. So the sensitivity of the instrument is completely lost if you do it uh, dressed. There's also a more philosophical reason why I insist on all my performances to be naked. My technology is, at all, is also naked. If you look at this robot, it is a little bit aesthetically unlike common robot, kitchen robots, or, thing, or cars, and things like that. Why? Well, because and it's an ideological aspect, I refuse to pack my electronics, my mechanics. I want reader to create readable machines so that you can, by just watching it, you can see how it works, and you can really read them off. You can see the circuit boards, you can see what chips are used, what kind of stepping motors, what kind of gears, etc., etc. Nothing is, is hidden. The contrast with a human body is something I particularly like. Yeah. I think that's Thank about you. it. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. <laughs>